Okay, off we go. Uh, right, send me links and whatever, or go to our website there uh, for previous editions. And you can contact me about anything that you want to go in directly on that uh, email address. Okay, here's your question. It's related to a mayoral election. It's an interesting bit of transport policy. Who said, this is the quote, he or she starts explaining, oh, it's him, yeah, okay, so it's come down to men only. He starts explaining his plan to reduce pollution in London, which does not involve incentives. You just say to people, don't drive your kids to school, and it's a cultural thing, and they get it. Well, it's pretty interesting uh, transport policy. Okay, who said that? It's Lawrence Fox. Uh, so, yeah, and there's an interesting bit on Twitter um, from uh, 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 Jules Matson, who's a paramedic, and you can have a look at that. Okay, and here, this I got this from uh, Gary Utram. Uh, it's from the government about uh, how you get your uh, your jab, and and it's important to travel safely. And yippee, an official document, no high vis or helmets. So thanks, Gary, for that. So you can go out on your bike without high vis or helmets and say uh, the government's told me this is a way to be safe. Right, important stuff. Uh, road traffic estimates in Great Britain 2020 from Department for Transport. Um, notice here, uh, pedal cycle traffic 45.7% above 2019 levels. This is the highest level of cycling on the public highway since the 1960s. So uh, let's have a look at it here. Uh, that's also from the same document. Uh, cycles up 45 and a half, buses down, 30 motorcycles down, lorries down a little bit, vans a bit more, and, and cars and taxis 24.7. But, uh, but it looks good, but it's by distance, don't forget, not trips. And there's been a lot of increase specifically in leisure cycling, which tends to be longer distances. And also, you know, it's all about to change. And it's a complex issue. We have to look at what working from home's about uh, in terms of both people who were driving and cycling, returns to public transport, and so on. And uh, there's another graphic done by John Garnsworthy, who sent this to me. This is national figures, apart from the buses that are TFL. And if you look at cycling there, there you see those big, this is the 100% baseline. Uh, there you see there's big increases which we saw last summer and they tail off until the end of 2020 it's kind of really back to nearly where it was and where we are at the moment he reckons is about a 20 percent um uh increase over last year uh and that i think is trips so uh some increase but not an enormous amount and most of it has been, most of those big numbers that we saw last year were, I think, to do with leisure cycling, um, which is good, but it's not as important as getting a, using a bicycle for everyday travel. Uh, here's something we're gonna hear a bit more about today. Uh, that, that's an announcement from the department about uh, some limited, uh, AV stuff on uh, uh, which you'll hear more about later from Christian and John. Uh, repeat this quote from last week uh, about how our roads should be limited to blue light services, electricians, etc., to taxis, to those who need to use our roads rather than the individuals that could be walking, cycling, and using public transport. That's uh, Sadiq Khan. Um, the, who looks likely to become London Mayor. Um, you might have seen Sean Bailey's video. Uh, it changed from, oh, uh, we're not living in the Tour de France to something a little bit more representative this week. And it could be indeed a referendum on LTNs. Uh, rather a silly quote from Grant Shapps about uh, uh, the so-called border tax of people driving into London having to pay a little bit more um, 
uh, this thing taxation without representation presumably if you drive into another borough there's different regulations uh on parking etc that is also some sort of taxation without representation um good for the ltn evidence base uh on um the uh who supports ltns by which party you normally vote for, uh, and uh, no surprises there. But don't forget, the uh, this is strongly oppose, oppose, and don't know. So it's it's really uh, the only strong opposition. Even with UKIP, uh, most people are either support strongly support or don't know. Um, Good thread from Adam Twen Tranter uh, about uh, the Daily Telegraph reporting that London ambulance staff were making some claims about LTNs delaying them. And he looks at that in the context of what actually is the delays to London ambulance service. Uh, your victim blaming for tonight. This is courtesy of Roger Geffen, it's slightly different from the usual victim blaming about tithes and lids. It's from Lord Lexton uh, asking um, for the hazards which arise when cyclists fail to use bicycle bells. And he's it's talking about the huge number of cyclists without bells, foul-mouthed elements, uh, some who seem to prefer pavements to their own designated cycle lanes, the bells are is this not shockingly irresponsible? And um, uh, Roger Geffen had to, uh, uh, I think, assist in some response to that. Um, it was actually quite a reasonable one was given by the government uh, minister. Um, uh, I told Roger to just get someone to say, get a life, you sad loser. But you're not really allowed to say that in the House of Lords. Okay, loads of stuff to read. This is all from previous weeks. A uh, new one on study linking childhood air pollution oppose, exposure to poorer mental health. And I, uh, on Twitter, noted that if uh, I've seen so, so many pieces of research uh, indicating why we need to reduce motor vehicle usage, particular internal combustion engine um, in urban areas and generally and you know if i had had all the copies of all the reports i've seen we could sort of turn them into uh, uh, uh barriers like uh planters at ltns and have ltns just about everywhere um new stuff to read a quite interesting thing on the top 10 reasons for failing the driving test in great britain forms of, of bad driving behavior which you can see every day uh, there's uh, the, the new target in Lord Slash Emissions, which I mentioned last week. Nice um, uh, article by Sarah Berry on how sat navs destroyed the neighbourhood. Um, this is uh, from Dr Briggs on uh, more evidence on how bad mobile phone use is for drivers. Don't forget Andy Cox is doing a charity run for support for road pieces running from where uh, Bridget Driscoll, the first person to be killed by a motorist, was killed at Crystal Palace to uh, the Arboretum, National Arboretum for Road Crash Victims in Staffordshire. If you can join in with him running or riding a bike and don't forget to give to Road Peace, they're a good organisation we work with and they support road danger reduction. Um, also, Rod King uh, has asked uh, for support for the uh, UN Global Road Safety Week, calling for 20 mile an hour limits, and there's a link for you to get in on. Uh, there's the Eventbrite uh, webinar on the 20th about doing research when it matters with Rachel Aldred and Ian Walker, who you know. A uh, nice graphic from School Streets, uh, the We Are Possible, on School Streets from the We Are Possible people uh, on uh, getting School Streets in. Um, I mentioned this last week. Uh, this is uh, Mark talking about why there shouldn't be exemptions um, for low traffic neighborhoods otherwise those exemptions will grow and anyway they will make the ltn non-functioning 
And I kept that in again this week because uh, Sustrans have, have done a thread, uh, Sustrans London, saying more or less exactly the same thing. And uh, it'll all be, I'm not going to read through it, either of them all now. You can look at them on the uh, uh, on the YouTube version or just flick through the slides yourself. Election time mentioned this uh, before, stuff from Cycling UK uh, on local elections, Metro mayors, don't forget the police and crime commissioners stuff. Uh, and in London, we've got this. Also, uh, Sadiq Khan has not yet signed uh, the Climate Safe Streets campaign pledge, which um, Porritt and Berry have. So you can still do stuff in London. Um, an article, as is from the UK, an article in, uh, on why uh, the City Council should be listening to people, but it's not going to in Edinburgh. Uh, I've reported a lot over the last year that Edinburgh has been kind of dragging its feet. Uh, something from Leeds, but it could be anywhere outside London. Someone saying um, uh, the school street in Leeds has been going for six months with pe without people at the junctions enforcing it, cars have returned it's an issue for street closures that the signs aren't enough on their own what next is going to happen and it's a problem because of the difficulty of traffic management act 2004 part six not being able to use cameras etc uh but it'll be a problem throughout uh, the uk and it's also still a, a problem where there isn't proper enforcement proper closures in london so uh, maybe we should have a special edition just on school streets on where they're going and what's happening. Uh, good news in Exeter from Casper. There's a closure there in, uh, it comes under Devon County Council. Uh, London, there's a nice photo. Oh, that's something new, but it's Queensbridge Road. And there's a nice little photograph for you. Uh, okay, Harrow. Now, I don't really know the last, last but uh, uh, last week they were the Harrow Council were going to decide whether to remove uh, LTN cycle lanes, um, carry on with the school street, but um, uh, I think they took out the LTNs and the cycle lanes. Uh, go to that thread to have an idea of, of what lies behind it. Uh, in Camden, another six schools in Camden will get healthy school streets by July and uh, more to come later in the year. And this is in my borough of Brent, that's Sparks Bike Shop with Pedal Me. Uh, they are using cargo bikes uh, to for recycling connections. Um, uh, and that's in association with the council, I think. Um, uh, that's the another graphic I brought you showed you last week. You should have that stored up somewhere. It just shows what's happened from 1998 uh, up till the last up till 2018 in terms of license numbers of licensed vehicles and running all the way back to 1950. So do take a look at that trend and shudder. Uh, this is a nice little uh, uh, picture from Sylvia Gautaro in Brent. Uh, Kilburn High Road in 1943, nice pedal car, and look at no traffic down Kilburn High Road. Um, Eindhoven train station, there's the cycle parking, and there's the car parking. And finally, two cartoons from the very wonderful Dave Walker. Uh, this is uh, for the election campaign. Cycling should be for everyone. Simple changes that can make that possible. And uh, read through that cartoon at your leisure. Uh, and also the benefits of cycling. What's good about cycling? So take a look at those two uh, cartoons from Dave Walker. And uh, that's it. Any questions? Any corrections? Any news we missed as well? 
Thanks, Bob. Yeah. Looks like it. Slow news week. <laughs> um, have you yeah. have you noticed? Um, do you, I I wasn't here last week. Have you noticed the um, the human bollards um, uh, action that Oxford Pedestrians Association did? Uh, yeah, I think I mentioned that there was uh, a, a situation where there was, I uh, forget the road, there was some people, some motorists. Well, sorry? It was Merton Street, the very historic cobble road. And uh, motorists were going through when they weren't supposed to and people got in the way of the cars and, and police had to come along to tell yeah. Uh, motorists they weren't allowed to drive there or yeah. not so quickly yeah There's people people stood on the um, yeah. mo uh, um, automatic bollards that hadn't risen for three years oh um, i see uh, many motorists there were huge threads it's really interesting many motorists cannot conceive that um, no entry sign applies to them it's, yeah. it's quite remarkable why didn't the police arrest the uh, the um, pedestrians association people yeah, one of the motorists called the police and um, the policeman uh, told the motorist to turn around because you, know, you couldn't go through the uh, no motor vehicles uh, sign. <laughs> so, uh, yes, great win. Yeah, good news story indeed. All right, then um, we'll move on. We've got to... Oh, somebody else. Very quick, in, very we? quick, very quick. Go on then. Sorry, very quickly. Um, Hammersmith and Fulham, I don't have a picture, but someone might. They've put down the most extraordinary uh, things on their paths. I presume yeah. it's to deter, deter cycling and e-scooters, but they're yellow and black and they are put kind of, you know, like that. So if you were to try and get a wheelchair through, you absolutely couldn't. Um, they've also banned cycling through their parks between 10 and 3. It does seem that um, as they're woefully behind on cycleway nine they're doing as much as possible to make it really difficult for anyone to cycle safely especially with children cargo bikes that kind of thing but i don't have a picture so if there's anyone here who has the picture it'd be worth looking at it because yeah. it's completely not allowable i'll try and rattle through this in in 15 minutes although it's a, it's a longer presentation just a word why i'm obsessed with this issue as people who follow me on twitter know that um, and indeed, I've written a little book about it, which I will happily send out to people uh, if they want to copy. And why am I obsessed about this? Uh, I think it's because I realise this is a very big danger that it's coming. And also that a vast amount of money has been spent on it. Um, and uh, there are people out there who will push uh, for this technology to justify uh, their spending. In fact, I think we're winning, actually. I think that driverless cars are probably less likely to happen now than when I started writing about it five or six years ago. Um, but it's certainly worth uh, hearing about this uh, on the basis that you need to know who your enemy is. Um, and driverless cars are certainly not part of the solution, but part of their enemy. And you only have to look at, uh, I mean, extraordinary publicity that it gets. Um, you know, it, it, it gets this kind of complete hype about how this is going to solve all our problems, how uh, they're always about to come in three years time, uh, how they're going to, as uh, one of these cuttings here says, they're going to change uh, London, they're going to change the way we live, uh, and, and so on. Um, and you have to wonder, What's it all about? And I will try to, to explain, although I've just been reading a book that has probably given me more insight into exactly what it's about. And in the end, the, the, the answer might be quite uh, uh, banal. But so, you know, these cars are gonna be safer. Uh, that's the big advertisement for them. They're gonna be cheaper, although it, it's very unclear as to how, why they're going to be cheaper. Um, the whole basis of Uber wanting self-driving cars, I always thought was completely flawed because they would have to buy the cars without uh, having drivers. And these cars are very much more expensive, but nevertheless, it's presented as cheaper. It will increase road capacity. Now you can get your head around that, but um, I've never been able to understand how having cars with no drivers on the roads, clogging them up will actually increase road capacity. But there are some uh, arguments in favor of that. Uh, ditto reduce congestion. Um, you'll be able to live in streets where um, you know nobody needs to park anymore, nobody needs to own cars. 
I'll come back to that in a bit. Um, and it'll enable blind people, people with disabilities, all sorts of people with dementia to, to, to travel around in these uh, uh, vehicles. And in particular, although slightly less so recently, they're presented as this uh, triple uh, Nirvana, right? Where the cars are electric, um, they are driverless. So, uh, you know, they will be totally uh, uh, controlled uh, uh, without intervention from people. And therefore they'll be able to, you know, take you off to work and then take your kids to school and, and then be waiting for you when you come out of your office, all that kind of stuff. And crucially, they will be shared use. They think, where did this shared use come from? And the reason why they present this as shared use is because they realized there was a flaw in their argument, which is that you can't get reduced congestion. You can't get kind of fewer cars uh, on the road unless you say that these are shared use. In other words, you will replace the car you own with an app um, and the car will come along and you know the real uh, protagonist of this idea say, well, there'll be different cars available. So if you've got your kids in the back, they'll send a five seater. And if you just want to, to travel somewhere, uh, the two of you, you'll just send a smaller car and so on. I mean, the, the whole idea is promoted as, as kind of uh, uh, a concept that will completely revolutionize transport. And you only have to think just of a few objections, to the idea of shared use. You know, it's all very well if you live like me in the center of London, if you live five miles outside Guildford, the idea that there'll be a fleet of cars waiting to serve you uh, and, and to guarantee you access when you need to take your, your, your baby to nursery and then uh, go off to work is, is completely fanciful, but it is promoted all the time. How do these things work? Well, there's various versions of this. Teslas notably don't have the, the thing at the top, the LiDAR, um, but essentially they're a huge combination of, of uh, uh, sensors, cameras, uh, GPS signaling, uh, and usually LiDAR, um, and uh, uh, with an enormous amount of, of computers on board, probably up to eight or nine computers, uh, which actually uses up an awful lot of electricity. And there's always these ridiculous pictures. This is one of the most ridiculous pictures. What is it supposed to mean? You know, that, oh, there's these cars whizzing around with little blue circles around them. And there's all kinds of, of, of stuff like this. Um, these are the levels of automation. I won't go through them, but essentially uh, there's six levels. And the crucial one that you need to understand is the difference between three and four, because four is essentially that the car can drive itself at any point. Three still requires a human driver to pay attention. And this is what this disastrous uh, announcement this week, which I think prompted Brian to ask me to speak about this, uh, got completely, failed to completely, un failed completely to understand is the problem about level three, because Grant Schatz was essentially saying, oh, we're going to get driverless cars and you can check your emails and you can watch, uh, you know, Harry Potter or whatever. Um, and then the car will get, warn you 10 seconds in advance that you need to take back, uh, back control. This is beyond mad. This is, this is so insane as to suggest that they have no understanding of what this technology is about. You are either driving the car or not driving the car. And the crucial thing here is the difference between level three and level four. And the fact that at level three, you still have to pay attention all the time. And yet the car will drive itself quite a lot of the time. And therefore, there's a real problem about when you take over, what you do when you take over, and, and how quickly uh, you have to uh, react. Um, I mean, this is, this is uh, uh, you know, the, the, the sort of thing we're looking at, although Google has tended to move away from this. This was a thing called Firefly. Um, and uh, they uh, initially thought that this was sort of the idea. Now they're really talking about adapting existing cars. At one point, they were, this model has changed all the time. And if you look at the history of, of Waymo, which is Google, you'll look at how, how the fact that they're kind of struggling to find what the right model is. But at one point it was going to be no steering wheel and now they've changed that. Here's one of the most daft uh, kind of promotions of this. Why would you want your pizza to be delivered by an uh, autonomous car? And of course, of course there's somebody in the back giving it to her. But um, you know, the notion that, you know, there you are watching match of the day and it's pouring down with rain outside and actually you have to walk down to the corner of the street and go and get your pizza. 
is just completely ludicrous, quite apart from the other obstacles. But it just shows the extent to which uh, there are uh, uh, the publicity is 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 crazy. Um, in my book, I uh, have invented something called the Holborn problem, um, which, if any of you have uh, gone through Holborn um, in normal times, pre-pandemic and hopefully post-pandemic, at six o'clock in the evening you'll realize that it would be completely impossible to get a driverless car through this sort of crowd because uh, you know, the driverless cars cannot run over pedestrians. They have to be programmed not to. Uh, there are other issues about that and I'll mention one or two, but, but essentially they have to, they, 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 the old uh, Asimov robot principles must, must apply. Um, this is rather amusing. This is uh, uh, a guy who uh, collates uh, predictions um, and uh, the ones with pink have all kind of failed uh, so far, and the other ones uh, are, are still in the future. But these were predictions as of 2017. Um, and uh, as you can see, uh, every prediction, every prediction that has ever been made about this uh, has actually uh, failed so far. Um, uh, which is greatly reassuring in, in many ways, but but uh, you know demonstrates uh, the title of my book, which is "Driverless Cars on a on a Road to Nowhere," and some of this is really uh, so off the wall that you think, how come people are being paid to this? This is a, a report by an organisation called Rethinks in in, in twenty nineteen, where they actually said. 95% of US car miles will be traveled in self-driving electric shared use vehicles by 2030. Now that is beyond mad. And, and you think, I, I did bump into the guy who runs Rethinks and I said, this is not a prediction. This is just a lie. You know, this is not feasible in any, he said, oh, well, we were just kind of, it was just a theory. And I said, no, it wasn't. You, you actually kind of put this, this got a lot of publicity. You know, th this actually helps create the atmosphere in which, uh, uh, in, in, in which uh, th these ideas are being pre pre presented. And it's complete and utter what Americans call uh, BS. Um, and Tesla itself has uh, you know, been deeply guilty of this. And Tesla is a special case in this. As I say, Tesla doesn't use LiDAR, it uses kind of other stuff. But Elon Musk keeps on coming out with promises about uh, the technology and, I mean, I, 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 it's difficult not to say they're just lies. He knows that this is not happening. I mean, uh, you know, two years ago, he's basically said that everybody with a Tesla will be able to leave it overnight outside their house and they will be able to uh, be then taken automatically to the nearest town, operate as a taxi, earning the money and then come back uh, uh, in the middle of the night back home. I mean, completely insanely nuts and what's amazing is that people still swallow this stuff and his share price still goes up um and uh this is the reality uh um there have been several accidents involving teslas with with uh white uh lorries uh they particularly with the sun shining on them they particularly find that uh, kind of difficult and while this one didn't result in any injuries uh, several have actually uh, 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 killed people. I've, I've talked about Asimov's law. This is the kind of sort of insane idea you get. Um, cars will have Teflon on them, and and uh, so that if you if you then uh, uh, kind of get hit by it, um, you will stick to the bonnet with the Teflon rather than uh, uh, being run over and killed. Uh, and this will mean that it will be easy to uh, uh, therefore uh, have uh, autonomous uh, vehicles. As I've mentioned, this is the real problem, is, is that there is no way that you can get over the handover problem. So you need to develop level four, level five, where they are nowhere near uh, uh, the technology. Um, and even uh, Waymo's boss uh, did uh, at one point say that the whole Nirvana idea of shared use driverless cars everywhere is not gonna happen uh, for, for quite a while. Um, this is Thatcham, who've been quite active in the recent uh, stuff. Thatcham are, uh, represent uh, insurers, and they do a lot of good research um, on an airfield in, uh, uh, in Oxfordshire, where, where I've actually been and smashed into a, a car that we were supposed to be avoiding. Fortunately, they make their cars out of polystyrene, and, and uh, we weren't hurt. But there's a GIF on my website you can uh, look at, which is, is quite amusing. And they're very worried about the perception and, and the stuff that came out last week is really worrying that, that Grant Schatz has not understood the type of perception 
he's uh, suggested by saying that people can use uh, their driverless car technology up to 37 miles an hour on motorways. I mean, completely and utterly uh, bonkers. Why is the 200 billion pound being spent? Well, as I say here, most of it is footloose capital from uh, tech firms or uh, desperate capital from uh, auto manufacturers. Essentially, uh, the book I'm reading at the moment called Driven by a guy called Alex Davis came out earlier this year, really does demonstrate the extent to which this is a Google project. This is Waymo, Google, really that have been driving this all the way uh, 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 from uh, the beginning. And indeed, the, particularly Larry Page, one of the founders of Google, is obsessed with, with uh, the idea of driverless cars. And much of the money has come from them, but by no means all. A lot of investment has come from this. And think what you could do with $200 billion uh, if you were spending it usefully on something that was uh, socially uh, uh, useful. So of these claim benefits, as I, this was my slide from earlier, um, uh, you know, I think that none of these are, are actually uh, going to be delivered, but an awful lot of money is still being spent uh, uh, on this uh, technology. This is the Grant Schatz thing, uh, which, which he, uh, uh, this was actually the coverage in August, uh, and now they've, they've reiterated this. Um, it just makes no sense at all in terms of road safety. I'm sure Robert Davis would have a lot to say about it. Um, uh, this was Addison Lee a couple of years ago said that, well, um, since these cars don't work that well, we need to redesign streets to accommodate them. Again, one of the reasons why I've been so actively opposed uh, to them. Um, this is this guy, Michael Decourt, who's a whistleblower, um, who thinks that, uh, uh, who worked in the industry at the time, also worked in aviation, and thinks that we're way further, this is way further in the future than any of the car companies would admit. And of course, if, if it really is 20, 30 years ahead, nobody is going to invest their, their money in it. Um, and uh, this was something that uh, uh, just happened uh, recently, whereby uh, which was released recently, which shows that actually um, there are um, a greater number of accidents involving these vehicles than ordinary. What happens is they get hit from behind. They drive in a very boring, tedious way and, and people uh, kind of don't realise and they stop. You know, if a mouse runs in front or something, they, they, they train to stop. Of course, the, the big disaster was the, the death of Elaine Hertzberg, who was killed by an Uber, precisely because Uber had actually disengaged uh, some of the safety features and the safety driver wasn't wasn't uh, paying attention. So as I say, uh, you can uh, get hold of a, a copy of my book. Now it's a second edition. Sorry, this I rattled. I've tried to rattle through this quickly, but um, I'm very happy to engage in email conversations or anything with or, or give this presentation to any groups because I think it's very important that we we debunk uh, this whole concept. Thanks, Christine. That's great. Um, yeah, well. We're open to a few questions and then what I'll do is I'll bring John Park in and then we can have a, a proper debate at the end, but I'll, we'll take a couple of questions now. Charles, did you have a question? Yeah, um, thanks, uh, Christian. I'm so happy to see somebody as hot under the collar as I am about this subject matter. Um, two points. Um, you're preaching, I suspect, to the converted here. What, what sort of engagement have you had with the Department for Transport, the Transport Systems Catapult? where millions have been spent in the UK on this. Have you had any? Uh... Um, uh, well, I did in the earlier stages, and I did even have some conversations with a couple of ministers. Um, but um, Zenzik uh, and Oxbotica and the various other people have banned me. Uh, they don't answer my emails. They don't answer the telephone to me. Um, basically, um, well, Zenzik uh, and Oxbotica will ban you. Obviously, Sorry? because that's in their interest. It's really the Department for Transport. I mean, surely they see your logic. Um, well, I have, because of uh, because of uh, COVID and stuff, I haven't bumped into any, you know, I, all those parliamentary receptions where you could uh, uh, buttonhole people have not been happening. But I hope when they resume, I will be able to hand out a few more copies of my book. But um, uh, you know, I've written pieces for the Times on this. I've written uh, various pieces uh, in different places, but uh, I've spoken at uh, probably about a dozen conferences on this. Um, but uh, you know, there are very big forces ranged against me. 
Uh, yeah, well, you know, I think it's fantastic, and any way I can support you, I'd, I'd, I'd be happy to do so. One small area where autonomous vehicles, as opposed to autonomous cars, could possibly, possibly be considered useful um, if, and I don't know the, the cost breakdown of uh, public transport of buses, but if the labour of a driver is, say, 20-30% of the cost of running a bus, you could possibly, possibly argue that an autonomous bus might allow cheaper. Yeah, I somewhat, I somewhat dispute that, actually. That was the whole basis of the Uber self-driving model, which, of course, has now collapsed because they've sold their self-driving uh, capability. Um, but uh, the extra cost of monitoring uh, these buses, um, as well as the extra cost of the equipment, I think uh, would obviate any savings. Yeah, uh, I agree. Driver, quite apart from the fact that you know, having 60 people on a bus without uh, anybody on it in case of emergency or whatever is probably not a proposition that yeah, yeah. public transport. So even in that use case, maybe in an airport shuttle, you might get some use. But I think all that's irrelevant to what most yeah. of us care about. Well, the best of luck and happy to support you in any way possible. Well, let's, let's go on to another question. Dave? That's it. Uh, yeah, it's a few points to pick up on, Christian. Um, the parity checks, I've worked with Anthony Anderson, who's done a lot of expert witness stuff on electric car crashes, and also the famous London bus, the number 11 that crashed, uh, where a rogue signal gets on and tells the vehicle to run at full power, and uh, telling the electric motor to run at full power then switches off the brakes, because you can't have the two things operating at once. Um, so road signal issues, um, the, the software and the programming is not like an aircraft. It's much poorer quality. Um, it's not got parity checks. It's not got triplex circuits. So um, you can't get that thing done. Uh, and finally, the uh, guy, I think it was Peter at um, Cycling Scotland, had a Volvo with uh, follow automation where you could switch it on, it follows things and it detects. And if the car in front turned off, the brakes came on because the sensor lost the signal that was a vehicle in front. So you had to be on the ball. If something that the system didn't react to properly happened, you had to take over control very quickly. Right. Thanks for that. All right, let's move on to Steve. Thanks for the comment, babe. Steve, yeah. all yours. Uh, uh, hi there. Uh, I don't think um, they've considered the environmental impact of the uh, infrastructure to run uh, driverless vehicles. Uh, some of the um, sustainability conferences I've been to, they mentioned that uh, social media alone consumes more energy uh, through all the service working than both Japan and Germany combined. So you can think of all the extra energy behind all the computer servers for the uh, infrastructure I, I know they've got their own on-board computers, but uh, I don't think they've actually considered, um, you know, the energy required to actually run the system. No, you know, that, it must uh, be absolutely that, enormous, you know, if you've got a number of cars. That, that is uh, uh, exactly right. But, but actually the cars themselves, quite a, a high proportion of the uh, electricity the cars consume will actually be to run uh, all these various sensors, cameras and uh, uh, the software. So uh, actually, they are likely to be more expensive to run than uh, conventional uh, uh, vehicles. And, and that's something that, that there are all these issues, because this is very secretive. I mean, Apple have been working on it. Waymo have been working on it, obviously, for, for, for 12 years or something. And various other companies have worked. And, and it's all done in, 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 in very great secrecy. There, there, this is not an open kind of discussion no. about either, let alone the pros and cons, but about the technical difficulties that they're yeah, encountering the and how they're trying the to overcome them. You... Google actually ran their cars on the highways of California for about three or four years, testing equipment without telling anybody. I mean, so, uh, you know, this, this, is, this is not a, an open kind of... Uh, industry no no I, I agree with you entirely you, you know you think of all the infrastructure power that that's required i i know google's got to go north of the um attic cir circle just to keep the service cool because they consume that much power and the same yeah. with facebook you've got to be near the nuclear power station i think in normandy 
but you think of all the, the power for the computers and the servers to, to drive the network infrastructure for the driverless vehicles must be enormous. As you say, there's all these hidden costs of, uh, of energy, you know, that that's just sweeping underneath the carpet. No, you're right, Christian. Great presentation, by the way. Thank Enjoyed you. It. Thank you. Well, maybe Elon Musk will do what Tesla actually tried to do and get the free energy. Who knows? I'll, I'll move over to, to George. Oh, you're still unmuted, George. Yeah, I could see that you came off, but we can't hear you. Yeah. Hello. Where are we going? Hello. Yep. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, we can hear you. Great. Uh, thanks, Christian. That was a great um, thing. One thing I've, uh, this is something very close to my heart as well, as a bit of a reformed petrol head and now cycle campaigner down in Hampshire. Um, one thing I think that has driven a lot of this assisted driving and automated features is the sheer scale of cars. I see a lot of these features as workarounds for something that's inherently wrong with massive cars to begin with. And they're effectively putting these things in for, for cars that are probably too large for a lot of people who took their tests many years ago to drive. And so they're effectively doing a job of not hitting you before the person who's probably a bit out of their depth in the car in the first place does so anyway. So um, the work they they've kind of maybe to me I think they're kind of standing the manufacturers are standing on the shoulders of safety stuff and suggesting that it can go autonomous. Um, I'm largely in, I'm very much not in favour of massive heavy cars that weigh two thousand kilograms, obviously. But um, uh, I am in favour of some safety systems, autonomous systems coming in to help with minor, potentially minor things where people might be less, um, uh, less attentive. However, that doesn't, that's not an excuse, as we know, for things like a terrible use of mobile phones at, at the wheel and uh, other distracting gadgets that seem to be putting more and more into cars at the moment. So um, I think the, the level three, I, I completely agree, level three will never be progressed upon in my lifetime. I honestly don't think that. I don't think there's any capability for any driver to understand when to engage an autonomous system and when not to, um, quite frankly, uh, and, and having to make that decision is laughable. So um, I think one important point, which I, I'd like to discuss with you further, is just why manufacturers are doing this. And my answer is that the cars are just huge and they're doing it to effectively get rid of, uh, sort of design out that, that fallibility of the problem of the cars in the first place. Um, I've, I've racked my brains about this literally for five years and talked to probably a couple of hundred people about why, why they're doing this. And the only thing I can come up with is that there's two kind of uh, separate uh, things here. The tech companies just have this footloose capital. And really this is, this is Larry Page and Sergey Gwyn, Glynn, whatever his name is, uh, Bryn. Uh, it's their project, and 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 they've it's spawned a lot of kind of other uh, uh, projects out of that. But a lawful lot of the money is coming from 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 them, um, and the auto manufacturers are terrified that the other auto manufacturers are going to get there first, and and their 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 eyes have been kind of you know staring ahead at this kind of notion that somebody is going to come up with a driverless car that will absolutely dominate the market and it won't be them. And I think over the last year or two, I have noticed a shift in both the coverage and in what's coming out of the uh, industry in that there's a, that it's a lot more tentative and no longer are they talking so much of the, the three-pronged nirvana that I mentioned. Um, and they're a lot more hesitant about uh, making their uh, 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 predictions. And as you say, George, what, the, the thing that most worries me is that people like Shaps failing to understand this and will encourage people to do what Tesla has encouraged people to do and killed a lot of people, which is to uh, uh, ma allow the tech to do too much. And the whole thing about the incremental stuff, I take your point that some driver's aids are useful, but the minute that uh, they start taking over some of the routine aspects of driving, they de-skill people. Um, I mean, last night I watched the uh, plane going into the Hudson film, and that is brilliant because it actually shows 
how uh, humans are different from uh, the automation. Because when they ran the simulation, they said, oh, you could easily have flown back to LaGuardia. And actually, uh, they couldn't because they needed uh, half a minute to think what the hell to do when your two engines blow out and are full of kind of birds and, and uh, are burning. And that is absolutely crucial for, for uh, the driverless car thing as well, which is that people will need time to take over, right? And by then they might have run over half a dozen cyclists or smashed into three different cars. And, and I think, as you say, they will never get around the, the, the level three problem. They will never be able to have a workable level three. They have to go straight uh, to level four and five. And I think that is virtually impossible in the sort of streets that, uh, uh, you know, that exist outside of American grid cities. Well, yeah, no, uh, powerfully put. Yeah, I mean, I must admit, when I was thinking of this topic, I was going, oh, it's a bit 2019 talking about this now. <laughs> kind of almost like a gun, but, but it's still with us. Bryn, your you question? Yeah, um, just, to, just for more sort of, um, excuse me if I take it a bit too philosophical here, but it seems to me that um, there's a, a much, much deeper, bigger problem with driverless vehicles than anything to do with the technology. If we were to get to the state of whatever it's called, level five, where these things, let's, let's imagine that exists, that, those vehicles can only work in an environment where there are people not in vehicles, say on bicycles and cars, if they are guaranteed to be able to recognise those persons and stop immediately. The moment that happens, the power to stop that vehicle is not with the driver, it's with the pedestrian. And importantly, it's with every pedestrian even the disenfranchised, the angry, the punky, you know, and not wishing to demonize any section of society, but can you imagine some angry teenager on a skateboard, sorry, I've just done that, running in front of a car because they can, because the car stops, and then the car stops suddenly and the person smashes their nose on the steering wheel. That's never gonna be allowed. That level of, of giving over power to pedestrians is just not gonna to be tolerated. Unless, of course, we get the equivalent of jaywalking laws, which then preclude what we can do. So it seems to me there's something deeply morally problematic about the whole concept of. Sorry, I'm getting on my high horse here. But... No, no, I, I, I have, uh, I have uh, examined that in my book actually, and uh, I realised that uh, actually, yes, driverless cars would transfer uh, the ability. I mean, that's my Holborn problem, right? That, that's why it's impossible to drive through Holborn. But it, it also, uh, you wouldn't go the back streets of uh, Johannesburg in a driverless car, would you? Because anybody could uh, stop you and bad people, as uh, Donald Trump used to call them, would attack, be able to attack the car. So it's completely unviable. And when I put this point to various kind of uh, protagonists, they say, oh, no, no, we'd be able to deal with it. You know, you'd be able to kind of uh, lock the doors and so on. And they don't seem to understand uh, 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 this uh, issue at all. Um, um, John, whose second name I've forgotten, uh, at uh, UCL, who does the, who wrote the book on risk, um, yeah, um, he uh, uh, you know he made this point very forcefully to me right at the beginning of this, and I took it on board totally. That actually these cars are unworkable; they, they're just unworkable per se. And and what's amazing is that you put these ideas to uh, uh, the the manifest or the, the people kind of promoting them. And they literally just ignore that. They they just they, they won't address that issue. But but you're dead right, Bryn. It, it it makes the whole concept impossible by oddly enough giving power to the pedestrians. And of course, that the what what Addison Lee would then say is, well, we have to ban pedestrians from being anywhere near these cars. And that that's one of the reasons why I've been so opposed to them right from the start. Yeah, um, yeah, I think we'll move on, but I've got I've got one quick question I've got to ask. Just there. It's almost like a horrific BBC balance style question of like the, the potential benefits of this. And, and I've heard people out of respect like uh, talk about these benefits and that's freeing up curbside space and the whole mobility as a service and this being part of it that you just go, oh, I want to get from there to there. And it turns up, saves you having to have your car parked outside the whole time. And that, that whole drift to that and the fact that this has been kind of caught up in that kind of service-based model. Just wanted to get your reflections on that before we move over to the professor. That well, big well, the idea that 
uh, you, they would have to stop anywhere to be to, to, to the curb in, in the same way actually Uber does actually. Mm. Um, <laughs> and, and that merely com compounds the problem. I, I, I've never I've never managed to understand how they how the, the supporters of this idea think that you would replace your car with an app that kind of gets your car to come somewhere towards you and then you get in it. I mean, the pizza delivery thing, I think, highlights that perfectly. Um, you know, who is ever going to want uh, a delivery by a, a driverless car if it, if it involves not managing to knock on your door? Um, and again, I just think, uh, Brian, that it's just another aspect of this that um, they haven't sufficiently examined. And yet, and yet, they still keep on spending these literally hundreds of billions of dollars on this concept. And so although somebody's asked that question and I've answered it, and I've written, a, I've written and thought about this for five or six years, I still don't understand. It's still a mystery to me as, as to what, what is this all about? Oh, well, actually, yeah, that's a good segue into like a, the Ask a Professor section, because whenever I don't understand anything, see, I'm getting seamless at this, I, I asked uh, uh, Professor John Parkin, and, uh, and I'll, I'll give him an intro as well, like, uh, he's the guy that trained me, so whenever I'm uh, coming unstuck, uh, I ask John, and he always tells me the answer, so John, can you give us a bit of an academic perspective using that big brain of yours, you know? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. I'm not sure I've got a very big brain. Um, right, I can't see how you, uh, well, a slideshow, here we go, oh there, from current slide, there we go. Well, this is very much going to be a reprise. Um, Christian's built the brick wall. I think all I can add is one or two um, pieces of cement in the mix, I'm not quite sure. Um, so going nowhere, perhaps. Um, I'm going to split into two parts. The first part, we'll be sharing some evidence from some work that we did on trust in autonomous vehicles, and then secondly, some thoughts on street design. So uh, it, why is it not advancing? Is it advancing for you or not? Oh yeah, I've got a big picture of me now. That's just me that's done that. I can only see your first slide, John. Okay. And normally, if you click on it and then start moving, like with your with your cursor, sometimes. Does your right arrow work on your keyboard? There we go. Okay. So I'm one of these people who's benefited from this because we bid for research money, so it's kept me in employment. But I was only interested in um, getting involved with autonomous vehicles if I could, in fact, uh, a, um, look at issues to do with pedestrians and cyclists. So on our third trial on a project called Venture was looking at autonomous vehicles uh, performing in three um, very typical situations, one overtaking a parked vehicle, two approaching a zebra crossing, three making turns at a side road junction with and without pedestrians and or cyclists. And we were interested in understanding three things. Firstly, um, how trust varied um, amongst those different maneuvers and uh, in fact, um, whether or not the with, with the pedestrian or cyclist present, the trust was different. So that was the first research question. Secondly, it was about whether um, each of those different types of road users, the pedestrian, cyclists and the drivers uh, had different levels of trust in the AV. And finally, how trust in the AV varied depending on whether it was a vehicle in the uh, real world or in the simulator. And the point about that is that a lot of work is done in simulators and of course they're not the real world so uh, what, what's the difference between the two so the first question then what we found was generally speaking there was very little variation in trust at all between those different maneuvers we only found differences in trust for two types of maneuver on the road in in the real world situation the trust was higher when the av needed to give way to an oncoming cyclist when overtaking the parked car as per the picture and in simulation we only find that trust was high when a cyclist was crossing a side road and the AV had to give way turning right into the side road so both of those situations the trust was high when the cyclist was present 
So the implication for that might be pointing towards, but bear in mind that most of the trust, there was very little variation in trust between any of the circumstances, and might be pointing towards um, the implication that uh, when AV behaviours are made clear in fairly complex situations and overtaking a parked car is certainly a complex situation, the vehicle has to judge the speed and distance of the oncoming vehicle and judge whether they'll get past in time and so on and so forth. So perhaps people appear to be reassured and their trust may be slightly greater. So the second one then, uh, the question was about differences in trust between the different types of road user and essentially we found none. I mean most people actually do, we, we were taking people over 18, most of them had driving licenses but we were very distinctly wanting to get them to think about the AV and their observations of that from the point of view of either the pedestrian, the cyclist or the driver. So neither the, the role of the participant nor indeed their viewpoint because the driver um, participant was in the autonomous vehicle but the pedestrian and the cyclist were outside the vehicle. So neither their role nor their viewpoint impacted their trust. And then finally, and it's not advancing again, for some reason, it's very ironically not advancing after tonight, isn't it? <laughs> there we go. The effect of the platform. Now, I, I have a sort of concern with simulation. It's just not the real world. And what we certainly did find were what are called interactions between the platform, i.e. whether it was on road or the simulator, and the event uh, for some of the complex manoeuvres. That, so that indicates that the, the outcome value of trust was a function as much of the platform as it was of the um, the nature of the manoeuvre. So I think the point about that is that caution is needed when generalising from simulation to the real world. Okay, so that's the first part. And that kept me employed, it kept me busy, and I learned a little bit about pedestrians and cyclists uh, and their trust in AV. So street design, hmm, okay. So this is 1996. I've made the attribution extremely small there to spare the blushes of the consultants who put this together. But what I'd like you to notice is how those vehicles uh, are shown um, with sort of blurred. The impression is that they will be traveling at speed. This is only sort of six years ago. Um, you know, smack, smacks of sort of the 1963 Buchanan report and so on and so forth utterly aspirational and completely um, out of reality. I do think, and we, we've sort of had hints of this, I think somebody in the comments section has already mentioned Heathrow, there are probably four very distinct scenarios for use. One is segregated networks, the other is motorways and expressways, the other is the typical urban streets and, and roads, those are the, obviously the most challenging, and then finally pedestrian priority areas. Um, we just had a bit of a discussion about the size of vehicles as well. I think one of the biggest problems that we have is that our road design within the urban areas become more like the designs of motorways and expressways. In other words, they become um, uh, very cluttered with technology, traffic signal control and so on and so forth. As a result of that, sort of vehicles have grown as well, and we see no differentiation between these. Um, in, you know, the view through the windscreen, as it were, is, is um, very similar. But if we're beginning to think about uh, these types of network and autonomous vehicles, then I think the nature of the vehicle would absolutely have to be extremely different uh, in each of those areas. I'm very interested, though, in urban streets and urban design. Um, Christian's been over this before, so the problems we know what the problems of motor vehicles are. Uh, vehicles can travel at speeds well in excess of the speed suitable for the environment. That's a massive problem. Take up significant amounts of space. And I like the Shaw and Doherty quote, they're all too capable of undermining their own utility. And that has sort of um, resonances with um, Ivan Illich and tools for conviviality going back all the way to the early 1970s. And of course, they're environmentally damaging. I think there are additional problems then. So it's not even that AVs are going to solve problems. The additional problems are that potentially we will bake in high risk. 
and I hear with abhorrence um, researchers and consultancies writing things in their reports such as, um, you know, we can introduce AVs when on average they are better than current driving. Well, I just think what an incredibly low bar that would be to allow AVs onto our road network. And if that sort of things happen, then we really are uh, in difficulty. And of course, it discourages physical activity and perpetuates the attrition of spaces in cities that might otherwise be used for other purposes, referencing there Jane Jacobs. So let me get a bit more. Uh, we just had a bit of a discussion in the discussion about um, things like this. Um, Christian called it the uh, the Hoban problem. In a sense, I might call it the Cate's Terrace problem. I'll show you why in a minute. So in the highway code, stopping sight distance is 23 meters at 30 miles an hour. That implies thinking time 0.6 seconds. Deceleration 6.57 meters per second. Now let's think about we're in the real world. We're not in the world of technology where um, everything is just digital and you can make of it what you will. We have to comply with those conditions of the real world. And we have a coefficient of friction between a tire and a road surface, about 0.7 in the dry, 0.4 in the wet maybe. If we have a lot of water, then we might have aquaplaning and indeed it might go down to virtually zero. So that actually limits the deceleration to seven meters per second or four meters per second in the wet. So, OK, great advantage. AVs think quicker. Well, yeah, there's still a latency there. Uh, even if we reduce that to five hundredths of a second, then uh, if it's in the dry, the stopping distance is, um, is 13 meters, but in the wet, 23. So this begins to imply that the AV would need absolutely to understand what the coefficient of friction actually is between the tyre and the road surface in order to uh, limit its um, potential damage. So what speeds for AVs? This is Cate's Terrace. This is a parked car. Let's do a bit of thought experiment. Let's assume an AV stops for a pedestrian stepping out onto the road from behind a parked car. Let's also assume it should spot the pedestrian from, let's say, halfway back along the car, say three metres back. Let's say the latency is 0 0.05 of a second again. In that situation, you could not go faster than 40 miles an hour. But there's still a problem there. We, you know, I've just artificially set, as it were, the trading point at three metres. So in other words, I'm saying, well, uh, as long as I can see three metres ahead, then we're OK. Well, it could, of course, be less than that. Well, I don't know. What's the solution then? All this is pointing towards, you know, avo avoiding. And I think we've already had this discussion, but here are some numbers that, you know, help support that. I can't help but think about the class three mobility scooter, which on the carriageway can go at eight miles an hour maximum. So interactions then. There's still all sorts of problems with autonomous vehicles and interactions. We have obviously formal signalling, but there's an also an awful lot of informal signalling, headlight flashing, which means very different things in very different cultures. Uh, a headlight flash, despite what it says in the UK Highway Code, is actually an invitation uh, for somebody to, you know, come out of a side road. It's deliberately uh, not that in the Highway Code, but that's not how people behave. Um, eye contact, but you only get that below about 20 miles an hour. And of course, we have all sorts of benign and otherwise hand and face gestures that people offer to each other in the road environment. So all of that is a, a sort of social protocol that robots simply don't have. The really worrying thing here, I think, is um, and um, this is a transport systems catapult. This is UK transport systems catapult who describe humans as the, the non-compliant part of the system, which is, which is rather worrying. Humans, as seller, are unpredictable and therefore implicitly problematic. And um, the solutions that they begin to suggest, and uh, the technologists begin to suggest, are that humans should carry warning beacons. That, to me, reminds me of the 1927 Punch cartoon, and fundamentally, when no further on than we were a hundred years ago virtually on that basis okay so design and regulation the image on the right is in the city of london um now 
if we did, if we were to have some autonomous vehicles traveling at appropriate speeds, I already begin to hint at what those might be, if they had the protocols for um, being able to communicate, it may allow, I would rather hope, the liberalization of some of the stricter limits on the movement of pedestrians and cyclists. And you can see they're extremely um, devious routes and chunky barriers there preventing um, pedestrians from taking the shortest route at that junction. No autonomous vehicle would drive in excess of the de design speed. Absolutely not. In which case we, we would, in highway terms, be able to design much more like railways. And the vehicle would absolutely comply with the, with the geometry of the speed of the road. And we uh, would, would not need to have excess widths and um, latitude for drivers going faster than the speed. But the uh, power to fix the nature of autonomous vehicle usage kind of therefore, I would suggest, lies with those of us who design the public realm. But of course, all the all the play, all the running is being done, as Christian has indicated, where we where the footloose uh, money is. OK, Dwight D. Eisenhower, famous speech, 1961, when he left uh, when he was finishing being the president, handing over to John F. Kennedy, became known as his military industrial complex um, speech. And he says, yet in holding scientific research and discovery in respect, sorry, I've got images of people in the way there, uh, as we should, so we should hold scientific research and discovery with a certain respect, we must also be alert to the equal and opposite danger that public policy could itself become captive of a scientific technological elite. Now, unfortunately, I don't remember Donald Trump making an equivalent sort of um, defining speech when he left, but um, that's, a, I, I think, a really important statement for somebody to make whose background was certainly in the military area. Christian said it much better than I. We have the technologists disrupting and we have the automotive industry attempting to perpetuate and in my language therefore we have what, what I have termed the automotive industrial complex and that is our biggest problem uh, in a sense that we have today. So I was in fact invited to write a chapter for a book for the Institution of Civil Engineers, a couple of quotes from me in that, not published yet, nature orientation and management of networks for autonomous who will be the key. So we, we, it's what we design as civil engineers that, that will uh, if autonomy ever takes off, will be the key to determining how it gets used and decisions need to be taken by policymakers in the interest of society, the environment and the economy, obviously. And these decisions need to be based on evidence and advice from those involved in urban realm design. So quick summary. Trust doesn't appear to vary by, vary by road user type. AVs may bake in further problems. Uh, AVs speeds would need to be very low um, and frankly why not speed and acceleration limits on manual cars now anyway and again that sort of discussion has been touched on already it's not what the car industry would want. Interactions remain problematic between robots and humans and the whole AV industry is very much in its infancy and in a sense, the, the, the fundamental problem is they talk, the technologies talk about operational design domain. And we talk about good urban realm design. And I think uh, yeah, a particular problem of the very recent announcement by the government about this automat automat automated lane keeping is that that is the sort of something everywhere. You know, we've, we've got a little win. We've got something. Let's get it out there as far and wide as possible, because then that will be seen to be making progress. My supposition will be the opposite, that the absolutely uh, uh, most appropriate way forward is that when you've got everything within an AV, when you're absolutely 99% certain that it can do all that you think it can do, then you introduce it in a very limited um, place and see how it um, behaves. So there we go. That, that's my uh, additional contribution. Thank you. Brilliant. Brilliant. Wow. Really uh, amazing speeches back to back. Have we got any questions?
Uh, Kate, I can see your hand. And we've got to bring you in anyway. I was going to force you. Yeah, no, that's brilliant. But Christian and John, both fantastic. I, I think that the, I, so some of you might know, I did a psychology degree specifically because of autonomous vehicles. So I saw this kind of coming over the hill, literally metaphorically, and thought I wanted to understand it. Um, I've looked at a lot of the research about um, driver let off and the extent to which people reduce their own attention when they're driving. So in simplistic terms, if the vehicle is doing 30% of the task for them, you'd think the human would do the remaining 70% well, but actually they only do 40% of the driving and nobody is driving 30% of the car. So there's a sort of, there seems to be a big, big mismatch and there's, there's relatively little research about the, the behavioral adaptation of normal humans in level zero or one, you know, untechnologically enabled cars in the face of this technology, the, um, the theory of mind piece, you know, the understanding what the other person is perceiving and adapting your own behavior in response to it. Humans see a child at the side of the road and anticipate it may run out. Machine learning should teach the vehicle to do that. But if the human driving thinks someone else is going to adapt for that behavior, they actually stop responding to it. And that's exactly what we saw in, in Arizona. Um, and as far as I can see, the biggest benefit comes with the very the lower technology, the autonomous braking and the, the, the basic lane assist and um, intelligence speed assist. And the sacred cow things, I, I agree with John, I think what we'll see is as soon as insurers, so DFT are consulting right now on what the highway code should say in response to this technology. And what they've essentially said is, as soon as the driver, the, the vehicle is doing um, uh, this lane assist technology on motorways, the thing that's coming in later, later in the year, um, then you don't have to attend to driving. You know, you can have a sleep, but it doesn't explicitly say this, but essentially what it says in the wording, you can have a sleep, you can have a coffee, you can have a Kit Kat, have a co you know, read your paper, check your, check your texts. Um, and, you know, unless your vehicle is one that might require you to take back control, then just don't worry, everything's going to be fine. But actually, there is no vehicle that doesn't require you to take back control. We're not going to have the level five vehicle, in my view, in my lifetime, which statistically is 31 years. Um, so I just, I, that just seems to be the gap to me. I'm just interested in, in both Christian's and John's view. Has, is anyone really researching the, 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 the interaction response of the unautomated vehicles, the unassisted vehicles in the face of autonomous vehicles, the, the pedestrian that walks out because the last time they walked out and the car stopped and this yeah. time they walk out and it's not an, it hasn't got autonomous braking, never mind being an autonomous vehicle. To, to be honest, I, if, if I said no, I might be wrong because if I did a literature search, I'm sure I could probably find something on it. However, I think the, the, the thrust of your point is absolutely right. And in a sense, what we do is consume the benefit of safety interventions. So, you know, the classic one is autonomous emergency braking. You know you're going to be able to stop more quickly, so you brake later. And um, that is reflected in, in all sorts of ways in, in human behaviour. It happened with, with ABS, didn't it? I, I gather this is a small net benefit of ABS, but mostly people drive faster and closer. But of yeah. course, on oil and ice, it doesn't work. And that's actually the stuff you, you skid on most. Yeah, yeah. Well, faster and closer was supposed to be the congestion benefit of a uh, automation as well, wasn't it? Uh, Chris, didn't you want to come in? Uh, uh, no, I mean, I've got, I've got, I've got no, nothing really to uh, add about that. Um, I think I've made, I've, I've made my point. I have to actually leave in a couple of minutes. Uh, oh yeah, no, no problem. Because I'm using up all the internet capacity in my household, and my wife works from home. <laughs> oh, no, I'll go modern, no, modern problems. Yeah, it's, it's been brilliant having you. I'll, uh, Bob, Bob, come in with your question. Yeah, quickie. It's it's um, uh, to thank Christian. Uh, first of all, it's a very good review of his book uh, by me on it. And um, uh, I wanted to say something about Footloose Capital, which uh, has had is about to have a disastrous effect on my life. Uh, it's to do with transport, and I'll bring it up next uh, uh, next issue. And I'll also email Christian about that. But thanks to Christian and John for all that. And it just shows all this stuff. It's all about power. Who has power over whom, right? If the pedestrians or cyclists have that power, then they can change what happens with the cars. But that's can, not going to happen. I just, I just want to leave you with one thought, right? Yeah. Which is that all the transport innovations that dominate the transport conferences I and a lot of you go to, are all nuts, right? Hyperloop, yeah. 
mobility oh, as yeah. a service, which just seems to be an expensive way of delivering what we have already. Uh, uh, flying drones, yeah. uh, driverless cars, and yet these discussions dominate. I mean, I went to the yeah. American Transportation Conference a couple of years ago, and something like thirty percent of the uh, of the of the sessions were on driverless cars. And um, you know, I think one of the things you could discuss is how how we can keep rooted and and not go kind of on these balmy kind of uh, mm. tech oriented uh, solutions that are nothing of the sort. Yeah. I'll leave you with that thought. It's the Jetsons and everything else. And when we know the answer is just what we go on about, which is active travel and local transport. Mm. OK, thanks a lot. Yeah, we certainly can't argue with that. Well, uh, <laughs> I feel Thank like you. we just like finished the whole field of uh, transport tonight. We, I, I was trying my best to, to do the other side, but kind of with you the whole way. I, I know the penny dropped for me when I, I was out in Taiwan at a science fair and I was speaking to these Americans pushing like automated cars and I was going, cyclists, what are you going to do? And they said, it's all right, you're all going to have to wear chips. Yeah. And then we can pick you up. And I was like, yeah, good luck with that. <laughs> good luck with that one. That's, um, yeah, so it dropped a, dropped a while ago for me, but you know, it's still, it's still going to be interesting. There's certainly a lot of capital invested in, in pushing this forward. And, and cars are always the solution, aren't they? Of course they are. Just need to get better. Um, John, do you have any final wrap up things to say before we move on to, to Ruth to, to wrap it up? No, no that's that absolutely good. fine. In fact, our fence blew down in the wind last night and the man's just come round to fix it. So I'd better go and talk to him, I think. <laughs> Excellent. Well, yeah, there's a good practical solution with, with real engineering. All right. Um, well, we'll call it a day then. I'll ask uh, Ruth to come in with her final words. For once, I can do a final word based on the actual uh, talk today. Fantastic. Thank you, John. That was amazing. And Christian, who's gone. Um, my lived experience of being in Holland, where my partner lives, is that the kind of re residential street I live in, if I cross it anywhere, all drivers will stop for me. And all the issues that there are on pavements where people say things are in the way on a pavement, well, often people just walk in the road because drivers will give way for them on residential streets and uh, quite a few shopping streets. So a lot of it is about driver behavior and how we are perceived, those of us who walk cycle as our level of importance. And that's why I think the pyramid thing is so key. Um, and that was my last word really. <laughs>